I'm going to be preaching on the, the title of this sermon is called The Seriousness of Self-Examination. And I have no idea how this came about, really. Um, I think I was just reading some Puritans, George Whitfield, and I just thought, you know what, that'd be a good sermon, so I'm going to dig into that. So this evening, our text, if you could turn with me in your Bibles um, to 2 Corinthians. And the text is 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. And, and for the context of it, I will read uh, from chapter, uh, sorry, verse 1 of chapter 5. Um, no, chapter 13, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. I'll read verse 1 to 6. This will be the third time I am coming to you by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Every word shall be established. I have told you before and foretell as if I was present for the second time. And now being absent, I will write to those who have sinned before and to all the rest that if I come again, I will not spare since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me who is not weak towards you but mighty in you first of all for though he was crucified in weakness yet he lives by the power of God for we also are weak in him but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you verse 5 examine yourselves whether you are in the faith test yourselves do you not know yourselves that, Christ, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? But I trust that you will know that you are not disqualified. Before I go any further, I'm just going to pray. Heavenly Father, gracious God, I just pray right now in Jesus' name that you speak through me as I exposit these words of your blessed Gospels. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know that ye, not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. So, a little context to who the Corinthians were. That they were not uh, were, were doing and what was happening at the time. Why was Paul writing to the Corinthians? The Corinthians, during the time of the apostles, assumed the role of critics. They boasted about their expertise, knowledge and language. And like many individuals who consider themselves wise, they misused their wisdom and learning by criticising the Apostle Paul. And, and, and I'll read uh, from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 5. Indeed, I consider that I am not the least inferior of these super apostles, even if I'm unskilled in speaking. I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plan to you in all things. So Paul, he meticulously goes into extensive measures to prove in opposition to the deceitful super apostles that we've just read. That his apostleship is authentic as he has been authorised and appointed by the resurrected and exalted Lord Jesus Christ to proclaim on his behalf. Paul is stern in his determination to defend his apostleship because he is steadfast in his, commission, uh, in his commitment to defend the gospel. If he preaches, if the gospel he preaches is not true, then the Corinthians remain trapped in their sins and absence of hope. This is why Paul has taken a defensive stance primarily driven by his deep affection for his readers rather than a mere concern for his reputation. It is noteworthy that Paul, Paul's defence of his apostolic authority provokes. And in 2 Corinthians, it is exceptionally personal and autobiographical letter. 
Though this epistle, we gained profound insights into Paul's character as well as the dynamics of the church he addresses, arguably exceeding any other New Testament resemblance. So contrary to popular reports, Paul is not an insensitive and grumpy individual. He, he displays sensitivity alongside kindness, concern alongside confidence, and gentleness alongside firmness. So Paul's love for the church and the gospel is relentless. And he refuses to allow false teachers to sabotage his apostolic labour. His attachment to the new believers is so profound that he will not permit walls to infiltrate and devour them. Throughout his history, the church has faced temptation to embrace worldly qualities of success of the standard for church leadership. In our present time, it is often assumed that Christian leaders should emulate a successful CEO or a a captivating TV personality. Likewise, the Corinthians believed that a Christian leader should resemble an outstanding Greek orator of the day. These false apostles who infiltrated the Corinthian church challenged Paul's claim to apostleship by highlighting his suffering, his weakness, his lack of eloquence. Both then and now, power and charisma can mistakenly be seen as the defining characteristics of a blessed minister of the gospel. So in response to these baseless accusations, Paul presents his credentials. But they are not ones that we might expect. Now listen to this. He commends himself, along with the other apostles, uh, from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 3 to 10. It says, By great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labours, sleepless nights, hunger by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honour and dishonour, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true as unknown and yet well known as dying and behold. We live as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. And after disarming his adversaries and seizing control of their critical arguments, he turned the sword to their own vulnerabilities, stating to them, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how then as how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobate. Now, there's two words in that. Examine and reprobate. They're two words that come right here and and they they, they fly out right at me. And according to the Strong's Concordance of of Hebrew and Greek, and and I'll speak for for the Greek fans around here, it's called akodom, sorry, adokimos, adokimos, which means it's a negative particle and it means unapproved, rejected by implication, worthless, literally, morally, cast away, rejected, reprobate. Now, throughout this sermon, I'm going to pose some questions and it's, and it's about examination. And Charles Spurgeon, he, he brought these words about and I just thought it flowed wonderful. And I quote Spurgeon loosely, Have you delved deeper into your soul? Have you shed tears over your lost condition? Have you mourned your condition before God? Have you attempted to rescue yourself only to realise it was hopeless? Have you been compelled to place your trust in Christ alone? If so, 
you then indeed pass the test very well. Do you possess a genuine faith in Christ? A faith that ignites love for him within you? A faith that empowers you to rely on him even in the bleakest moments? Can you honestly declare that you harbour a hidden affection for the Almighty? That you cherish his Son, yearn his ways, sense the presence of the Holy Spirit and strive daily to deepen your connection with him? Firstly, let me delve into this text, following up, emphasise its importance, and finally, I'll provide guidance on how to put it into action. And I'll do that throughout, some more than others. And sometimes, if we don't, then you can fill in the blanks as well. How can we assess the Christ, our Christian life? How can we discern if our lives align with Christian beliefs? To find the answers, we must turn to the teachings of the Word of God. Please turn with me along with, to uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. And I'm going to read it. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So this passage, it begins with by affirming the fundamental truth about God. He is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. Light symbolizes purity, holiness, and truth. As such, God's character is completely free from any form of moral darkness or evil. To walk in the light means to live following God's character and his revealed will. It invokes walking in righteousness, obedience and truthfulness. To the, those who claim to have fellowship with God but continue to walk in darkness, engaging in sin and unrighteousness are living in contradiction to the truth. And John exposes the hypocrisy of those who claim fellowship with God but persist in sinful living. Such claims are lies and their lives do not align with the truth of God's word. Genuine fellowship with God necessitates a life lived in obedience to his commands. Those who genuinely walk in the light to then uprightly and truthfully experience true fellowship with God and with fellow believers. This fellowship is characterised by unity, love and mutual support in the faith. But furthermore, the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses those who walk in the light from all sin. This cleansing power of Christ's blood is ongoing purifying believers from the guilt and power of sin as they walk in faithful obedience. In summary, what we've just read emphasises the importance of living a life characterised by righteousness and truthfulness before God and others. Genuine fellowship with God and ongoing cleansing from sin are the blessings experienced by those who walk in the light. A second point, and, and it's uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Questions. Let me address you directly, because the majority of you may consider yourself Christians, but, the cru but it's crucial to heed this warning. It's crucial. Are you finding yourself slipping into sin? 
Have you noticed subtle changes in your behaviour recently? Things you wouldn't have entertained just a short while ago. And if you continue down this path, bit by bit, it may indicate you are drifting away from God. However, however, if God intervenes and pulls you back, it could be a sign that you are truly saved. And this passage addresses the necessity of acknowledging and confessing our sins again before God. In verse 8, it begins by highlighting the folly of denying the reality of sin in our lives. If we claim we are without sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth of God's word is not in us. This denial of sinfulness is not only self-deception, but also rejection of the truth revealed in Scripture. And in contrast to denying our sinfulness in verse 9, it encourages us to confess our sins before God. Confession involves acknowledging our sins honestly, taking responsibility for them, and expressing genuine repentance. When we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In contrast, sorry, this forgiveness and cleansing are not based on our merit or worthiness, but on God's faithfulness to his promise and to his justice demonstrated through the anointing and finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Indeed, acknowledging sin for truly what it requires, honesty and clarity. And, and instead of minimising our sin and sugarcoating our wrongdoing with euphemisms and excuses, we must confront it head on with a clear understanding of its gravity and implications. And this passage urges us, uh, urges language that ac ac accurately reflects the nature of sin, exposing it for what it is and refusing to downplay its seriousness. For example, whether uh, rather than uh, uh, dismissing sexual immorality as merely a minor temptation or excusing impure thoughts as harmless struggles, we should recognise them as violations of God's standards of purity and holiness by calling evil desires what they are, idolatry. We acknowledge the profound impact of sin has on our relationship with God and the worship we owe him. This approach cuts through the deceptions of our hearts and reveals the true nature of sin, which often, which often hides behind rationalisations and justifications. By using language that unmasks sins, deceitfulness, we confront it with honesty and humility, acknowledging our need for repentance and God's forgiveness. Ultimately, this pattern of language leads us to a deeper awareness of our sinfulness and, our greater, and a greater appreciation for the grace and mercy of God. It compels us to turn away from sin and turn to Him in genuine repentance and seeking His forgiveness and transformation in our lives. And verse 10 it reiterates the seriousness of denying our sinfulness. If we have claimed we have not sinned, we are not only deceiving ourselves, but making God to be a liar, contradicting his word and his testimony about the universal reality of human sinfulness. Denying our sinfulness leads to a rejection of God's truth and refusal to align ourselves to his word and his standards of righteousness. And, and John, uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1, 8 to 10, it emphasises the importance of acknowledging and confessing our sins before God. Denying our sinfulness leads to self-deception and rejection of God's truth. While confession opens the door to God's forgiveness, cleansing and restoration. I'm going to read now from uh, chapter 2, 
verses 3 to 4, and it's about obedience. Now, now by this we know that we know him. And if we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. John begins by establishing a connection between knowing God and keeping his commandments. True knowledge of God is evidenced by obedience to his commands. Obedience is not merely a matter of external compliance that reflects the inner transformation, transformation that occurs in those who genuinely know and love God. Verse 4 emphasises the inconsistency claiming to know God while living in disobedience. Anyone who professes to have a relationship with God but fails to obey his commandments is described as a liar. This stark language emphasises the seriousness of hypocrisy within the Christian church. John emphasises genuine knowledge of God is inseparable from his obedience to his word. Claiming knowledge of God while living in disobedience is deceptive and reveals a lack of authentic faith and spiritual transformation. And, and the role of the, uh, truth, the truth referred to here, encompasses the truth of God's word and the truthfulness of one's profession of faith. Those who claim to know God but live contrary to his commands are devoid of truth. Their actions contradict their words, revealing a disconnect between their profession and their lifestyle. Genuine knowledge of God is characterised by a life of obedience, rooted in the truth of God's word. Obedience becomes the natural outworking of a heart that has been transformed by the truth of the gospel. And what we see here, it emphasises the inseparable link between knowing God, obeying his commandments, authentic faith is demonstrated not only by what one professes, but also how one lives. Obedience to God's word is the litmus test. It's at a test which is a single factor, such as an attitude, event, or, or fact that is decisive. A genuine knowledge and relationship with him. My point number four. Love for the brethren, and it's, it's from chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. He who says he is in the light, but hates his brother, is in darkness until now. But he who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Questions. Do you enjoy being around individuals who share a mutual love for discuss worship and to serve God? Or would you rather be with people who have nothing to do with God? And this question, it speaks to our preferences and, our pro and priorities in relationships. Loving to be with those who share a passion for God reflects a heart inclined towards spiritual fellowship and growth. It indicates a desire for meaningful connections centred around our very faith, worship and service. And on the other hand, a preference for those who have nothing to do with God suggests a misalignment of values and poses a serious question to yourself. Do you love other Christians? Loving other Christians is a fundamental aspect of our faith in Christ. Jesus emphasised the importance of loving one another as he loved us. And I quote, you don't have to turn with me, but from uh, John chapter 13, 34 to 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I loved you. You are also to love one another by this. All people will know that you are my disciples if you love, if you have love for one another. 
This love transcends mere affection or sentimentality. It entails sacrificial service, forgiveness and genuine care for the well-being of fellow believers. More questions. Have you, how many fellow Christians do you support? How many do you study the Bible with? How many do you intercede for in prayer? And I've had that this week, thank you. How many do you show love towards? These questions prompt us to evaluate the quality and the extent of our relationships within the body of Christ. Supporting fellow believers involves offering practical assistance, encouragement and accountability. Studying the Bible together fosters spiritual growth and mutual edification. Interceding for others in prayer demonstrates our concern for their spiritual well-being and the advancement of God's kingdom. Showing love towards fellow Christians encompasses acts of kindness, compassion and selflessness. And John contrasts two spiritual states, light, darkness. Light symbolises the presence of God, truth and righteousness, while darkness represents spiritual blindness, sin, separation from God. These metaphors vividly illustrate the moral and spiritual conditions of individuals within the church. And in verse 9, John addresses the inconsistency of claiming to be in the light while harbouring hatred towards a fellow believer. Such a person remains in spiritual darkness, devoid of the love and the characteristics of those who walk in the light. Hatred towards a brother or sister in Christ is indicative of a heart that the love of God has not transformed. And verse 10, however, highlights the inseparable connection between abiding in the light and loving one's brother. Genuine love for fellow believers demonstrates an alignment with the truth and the character of God. It serves as evidence of one spiritual state and union with Christ. Verse 11 brings the dire consequences of harbouring hatred towards a brother or sister in Christ. Those who walk in darkness, characterised by hatred, are spiritually blind and directionless. Their animosity towards others only reflects a lack of understanding of God's love, but also leads to spiritual confusion and aimlessness. Hatred blinds individuals to the reality of their spiritual condition and hinders their ability to discern God's will. The, the darkness of animosity obscures their vision and distorts their perception of the truth, leading them away from paths of righteousness. And what we've just seen highlights the critical importance of love for fellow believers as evidence of your spiritual state. Hatred towards others is incompatible with walking in the light and indicates spiritual darkness. Genuine love, rooted in God's love, serves as a beacon in light in a world darkened by animosity and division. I'll just read now from chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. And it's on hatred of the world. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it is not of the Father, but it, or it is of, of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So John begins issuing a stern warning to believers. Do not love the world or things in the world. This command stresses the incompatibility between love for the world and love for God. To prioritise pursuits and values of the world above God is to demonstrate a lack of genuine love for the Father. 
verse 16 provides insight into the nature of worldliness, identifying three primarily, primary manifestations. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These categories encompass the sinful nature, sinful desires and pursuits that originate from worldly perspective rather than from God. The lust of the flesh refers to indulgence in sinful pleasures. The lust of the eyes involves coveting and desire for material possessions. And the pride of life encompasses arrogance and self-exaltation. And John emphasises that the, the worldly desires are not aligned with the will or character of the Father, but instead are characteristics of a fallen world system. They represent a distortion of God's intended design for humanity and lead individuals away from fellowship with him. In verse 17, it highlights the fleeting nature the fleeting nature of worldly pursuits and possessions. The world and its desires are passing away, subject to decay, fleetingness. And in contrast, those who faithfully do the will of God abide forever, enjoying eternal fellowship with him. John contrasts the temporal nature of worldly treasures with enduring significance of obedience to God's will. While worldly pursuits promise temporary satisfaction and fulfilment, they ultimately fail to provide lasting meaning or significance. And in contrast, those who prioritise obedience to God experience the blessings of his kingdom. And as we've seen, it underscores the importance here for the prioritising love of God above love of the world and its fleeting pleasures. Believers are called to resist the allure of worldly desires and instead align their hearts with the will and purposes of God, which leads to eternal life and, I'd add, true fulfilment. Point number six. John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, 24, 25. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If you have heard, what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, you also abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. John encourages believers to remain steadfast, in the teachings they received from the beginning of their faith journey. The exaltation emphasises the importance of doctrinal stability and being faithful to the foundational truths of Christianity. The, the, the gospel message proclaimed from the start of their Christian walk serves as a firm foundation for their ongoing spiritual growth and maturity. And verse 24, emphasizes the vital connection between abiding in the truths of the gospel and abiding in fellowship with the Son and the Father. As believers maintain their conformity to sound doctrine, they remain in communion with God, experiencing the intimacy of their relationship with Him. This relational aspect underscores the the significance of doctrinal integrity, fostering vibrant and enduring, connect, enduring connection with the Almighty God. In verse 25, it affirms the promise of eternal life as the ultimate assurance for those who persevere in the truth. This promise, bestowed by God himself, serves as a source of hope and confidence for believers as they navigate the challenges and trials of an earthly journey. And eternal life is not merely a future reality, but a, a present possession for those who abide in Christ and his teachings. And in summary, the importance of steadfastness, embracing and adhere, adhering to the foundational truths of the Christian faith by remaining rooted in sound doctrine and maintaining fellowship with God, we can find assurance of eternal life. 
and experience the fullness of our relationship with the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I'll just read now from 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. John presents a clear distinction between the children of God and the children of the devil based on their actions. The manifestation of one's true identity as a child of God or a child of the devil is evident in their conduct and their lifestyle. Those who consistently practice righteousness align themselves with God's character and demonstrate their status as his, his children. Whereas those who persist in unrighteousness reveal their allegiance to the devil. The practice of righteousness serves as a defining characteristic of genuine discipleship and divine adoption. Believers are called to actively pursue righteousness in their daily lives, reflecting the transformative work of God's grace within them. The righteousness, this righteousness, encompasses both moral integrity and commitment to justice, com compassion and holiness in all spheres of life. Verse 11 emphasizes the foundational message of Christian love that believers receive from the beginning of their faith journey, love for one another, not merely a sentimental expression, but practical demonstration of genuine discipleship, divine sonship. It serves as a tangible manifestation of one's relationship with God and fellow believers, transcending outward appearances and cultural barriers. As recipients of God's grace, and agents of his righteousness, as believers, we are called to embody the transformative power of the gospel in our relationships and our interactions. By practicing righteousness and cultivating love for one another, we bear witness to our identity as children of God and, the, and fulfill the foundational message of our faith. And in summary, John highlights the inseparable connection between righteousness and divine sonship, emphasizing the transformative impact of genuine discipleship and Christian love on believers' identity and their conduct. And I read now from 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he is in us because he has given us his spirit. John provides believers with assurance regarding their intimate relationship with God. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit serves as a tangible confirmation of their union with Christ and participation in the Christian life. Through the Spirit's presence within us, believers experience a deep sense of fellowship with God, characterised by communion, intimacy and mutual indwelling of the Spirit. The Spirit's testimony within believers serves as compelling evidence of our ongoing connection to God. It is through the Spirit's work of regeneration sanctification and empowerment that believers are enabled to live by God's will bearing spiritual fruit and experience transformation in our lives. The Spirit's presence is not merely a theological concept but a lived reality that empowers believers to live victoriously in Christ. And the Spirit's indwelling presence provides us with a profound sense of security and confidence in our salvation. 
It serves as a seal and a guarantee of your inheritance in Christ, assuring you of God's faithfulness, love and ongoing work of redemption in your lives. Through the Spirit's abiding presence, we have strengthened to persevere in faith, overcome spiritual challenges and experience the fullness of God's blessings. And as Christians, we are to cultivate a deeper awareness of the Spirit's presence within us and rely on His empowering grace in every aspect of our lives. By embracing the Spirit's testimony and yielding to His guidance, we will embrace a deeper intimacy with God, a greater conformity to Christ, and a more effective witness to the world. The Spirit's presence is not only a source of assurance, but it's a catalyst for spiritual growth, transformation, and ministry. In summary, the, the, the transformative formative impact of the Spirit's indwelling presence in the believer's life, assuring their abiding union with God, evidence of his divine presence and confidence in our salvation. And lastly, to my last point, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 to 8, and I'll, and I'll go and read this for you. And you have forgotten the exaltation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which you all have become partakers, then you are legitimate and not illegitimate and not sons. So the author of Hebrews quotes from Proverbs chapter 3 verses 11 to 12 to emphasize the importance of acknowledging God's discipline as an expression of his fatherly love towards his children. Instead of despising or becoming discouraged by God's fatherly correction, as believers we are encouraged to understand it within the context of God's love and care for us. Just as earthly fathers discipline their children out of love and concern for their well-being, so too God discipline his children for their spiritual growth and maturity. The author highlights the importance of endurance in the face of divine discipline, emphasizing that it is a characteristic of true sons and daughters of God by enduring chastening with faith and patience believers demonstrate their identity as legitimate children of God and recipients of his fatherly care and discipline rather than resenting or rejecting heavenly fatherly correction believers are called to embrace it as a means of spiritual refinement and growth the absence of divine discipline in the believer's life is portrayed as a cause for concern as it may indicate a lack of genuine relationship with God, just as earthly fathers discipline their children to instill character, integrity and obedience, so does God discipline, discipline his children to cultivate spiritual maturity and conformity to Christ. The presence of divine chastening serves as evidence of one's status as a beloved child of God, whereas Absence of, uh, of discipline may suggest spiritual apathy, disobedience, or estrangement from God. And as followers of Christ, we are urged to welcome God's discipline as an expression of his love and wisdom and care for our spiritual development and welfare. 
Instead of resisting and resenting fatherly correction, we're called to submit to it with humility, trust and obedience, knowing that ultimately for our good and God's glory, by enduring chastening with faith and perseverance, we can experience spiritual transformation, maturity and intimacy with God, bearing witness to our identity as true sons and daughters of the Most High. And finally, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 to 8, it highlights the significance of God's discipline in the believer's life, highlighting its role in expressing his love, fostering endurance, and conforming one's identity as a legitimate child of God. And finally, my final two questions. Finally, I'll ask two questions to the first question to the believer. As a Christian, you can confidently affirm that by God's grace you strive to live righteously, godly, self-controlled in a corrupt world. While acknowledging your past sins and shortcomings, you humbly seek God's mercy and rely on his grace to help you live according to his teachings. Prayer is not just a routine for you, it is the very breath of your soul. You pour out your heart before God, often with tears demonstrating your dependence on him. His word is not merely a book on your shelf, it is a living active force in your life, guiding your thoughts, decisions and your actions. You find joy and fulfilment in the fellowship of his people, actively participate in the life of the church and its gatherings, uh, even amidst the distractions of daily life, your heart is continually drawn to seek his presence, longing to commune with him in prayer and worship. Yes, you are a sinner in need of God's forgiveness, incapable of saving yourself through your own efforts. But you believe in the saving work of Jesus Christ, who died for your sins, rose again, offering you new life and hope. Through faith in him, you experience the true forgiveness, transformation and the assurance of eternal life of God. Then we have this verse. His master replied, and it's from Matthew 25, verse 23. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things, but I will put you in charge of many things. Come, share your master's happiness. And question two. And to the unbeliever, or the person that's here tonight, who is unsure if they're saved, the person who may be jealous of the wonderful Christian life that they witness. And I especially speak to the children here tonight. As human beings, we are born into sin. We are separated. We are separated from God. Our sinful nature leaves us spiritually dead and unable to save ourselves or earn God's favour. However, in his sovereign mercy and grace, God chooses to save people for himself according to his purpose. Salvation is a gift from God, not based on our works or merit. The good news is that God demonstrates his love for us by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for our sins. Through his sacrifice, Jesus offers redemption and eternal life for all who believe in him. If you feel a desire to know God and experience in his grace, it's because God is drawing you to himself. And I encourage you to recognise the reality of sin and need for a saviour. Turn away from your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Jesus invites you to come and find rest for your soul. Amen. Thank you.